Welcome, everybody. My name's Robbie Luckett. I know most of you in the room. I'm a professor of history at Jackson State and director of the Margaret Walker Center. I've been on the faculty and director here for 14 years. Welcome to the Creative Arts and Scholarly Engagement Festival, the Case Festival as we know it. This is our 17th year of doing the Case Festival at Jackson State. The Case Festival is a student conference where we lift up the works of our young students around the state on this campus across the region. We hope tomorrow you guys will make plans to join us for a day full of programming with student presentations, as well as a luncheon address by Dr. E. Howard Ashford. Dr. Ashford is a graduate of Jackson State. His new book, Mississippi Zion, about Atala County, Mississippi, has been winning awards, including the Book of the Year from the Mississippi Historical Society, a finalist for the Book of the Year from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, an award winner with the National Council of Black Studies. We're excited to have Dr. Ashford back on campus to talk about his great work, as well as a closing address tomorrow with Dr. Mary McGraham, who will give our keynote address tomorrow afternoon uh, at the closing session in the JSU Student Center Theater. At that event, we will also announce the winner of the annual $1,000 Margaret Walker Award, which is the writing prize that goes to a Jackson State student for the best essay. We will also present the $500 Doris Derby Visual Arts and Social Justice Award. Check out your program, check us out online. You can see all of the events that are coming up. Everything is free and open to the public. Please join us, including the luncheon. We hope you'll be there. Thanks to the Mississippi Arts Commission for making this all possible. All of you will receive evaluations. We hope that you'll take the time to fill those out. Those are important to us to report back to the Mississippi Arts Commission to show the work that we're doing here through the Case Festival. Today's conversation is particularly special. We're joined uh, by Dr. Mary McGrown and Dr. Carolyn Denard. Dr. Graham is the foremost Margaret Walker scholar with five books by Margaret Walker that she's edited, about Margaret Walker that she's edited and written, uh, including her latest uh, book, The House Where My Soul Lives, The Life of Margaret Walker, her long-awaited biography, the triumphant biography of Margaret Walker. <laughs> If you need your copy, we do have it for sale today uh, as well. Dr. Graham is a distinguished professor of English at Kansas, as well as the founder of the History of Black Writing, which she started at the University of Mississippi when she was on the faculty there, which is now resides uh, at Kansas. We're always grateful to have Dr. Graham here. She served on our board at the Margaret Walker Center for many years, um, and we're always glad to have her home. I said, at History is Lunch at Mississippi Department of Archives and History on Wednesday that there's been no greater ambassador for Margaret Walker and this center than Dr. Marion Graham. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and we're also joined today by one of our board members here at the Margaret Walker Center, Dr. Carolyn Denard. Dr. Denard is a 1973 graduate of Jackson State. Welcome home to the uh, <laughs> And she is the founder and chair of the Tony Morrison Society. I could read her bio, you got, and I could read Mariana's. You guys can handle that. Um, more importantly, here they're joining us to talk today about the legacy of Margaret Walker, and we're grateful to have them both, two of my favorite people, uh, together in one room. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn it over to these guys and, and get out of the way. Please stay afterwards for the reception. Uh, that we'll have, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Brown will be happy to sign some books as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bucket. Uh, as he said, I'm Carolyn Denard. I'm an alum of Jackson State, and I'm really proud to be back home, particularly on this occasion. I am also a colleague and good friend of uh, Miriam Graham. I've watched her work on this book for the last 20 years. <laughs> and so I am just as happy as the godmother could possibly be. Um, we, uh, I, I say to people sometimes that we were separated at birth. Miriam grew up in the South in the CME church like I did. She went to leadership training school the way I did. She majored in English and taught African-American literature and had four children. And I had children and worked. And so we've, we've um, really, walk the world together from 
uh, Harvard to Mississippi to Jackson State, everywhere. It's just been really a delight. And I'm proud to say that I'm working with her now as a consultant on the History of Black Writing Project. And so the fun just continues. So I am just really delighted today to have this conversation. I've waited for this book as she's waited for it, as we've all waited. And I'm sure it's more than gratifying to see it in the flesh and to be here and, and enjoy um, this work. Um, I just want to, um, if you'd like to say a few things before we begin, you're in, you can do that. And um, I'm happy to see all of you today. Um, this is a very comfortable space for me to be in. I would come here in the summers to read, and I guess the best story I had is that my son, my youngest son, was coming with me those early days, but I would put him in the, the Jackson State uh, summer. I mean, I think this, you, was, you weren't here yet. They had summer sports camp here, mm -hmm. and I would enroll Rance in the summer camp, and he said to me, I know why people migrate. <laughs> it was too damn high. <laughs> he was born in Mississippi, but you know, he left when he was young, so he didn't expect that. But at six and seven, you're coming into a summer camp and you're outdoors all day long, and I'm in this cool library, and we did that for four or five, you know, sometimes six weeks at a time, and for several summers, um, reading the collection. So it is, it does feel like home when I come, and. Um, um, and I spent uh, six years at the University of Mississippi, and uh, so I guess I needed to take some Mississippi with me, yes. and so um, taking Margaret Walker was one of the ways of doing that. So yeah. I'm really happy to see all of you, and I hope you enjoy today's discussion. I hope I learned something, too. Well, we're making you an honorary Jacksonian today, <laughs> since you spent so much time in Rance, too, if he's willing. <laughs> Um, but we are here today to talk about this wonderful new biography of uh, Margaret Walker, The House Where My Soul Lives by Marianne Graham. It is a um, riveting story of Margaret Walker's life. Uh, the detail is breathtaking. And um, <coughs> the narrative voice is warm and supportive and honest. And it is really just a great read. I've read lots of biographies, and uh, I, it is hard. When I saw this, I was daunted by 51 pages, and I thought, okay, Miriam, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get there. But it is, it just invites you in and keeps you there, and you learn so much. And I think, particularly for us today, I, I want to certainly talk about the book and the um, process, the writing process that Mariana went through and why she's attracted to Margaret Walker. But I also, for this audience, want to talk about how important Margaret Walker is to Jackson State. And I think uh, certainly uh, most of you know that, but there's more in this biography than perhaps you know already that was just astounding. And um, this was the last place for her. And so this was her home. And and to be able to come back and have this conversation here is really a special moment for all of us. So let me get, begin, uh, Miriam, as I've known you've worked on this for a long time, but one of the questions that I never really asked was what attracted you to Margaret Walker? You know, I mean, if you, if you do a one woman, if you study one author, as, as I do and you do, there is some kernel of attraction that brings you there and keeps you there. What was that for you with Margaret Walker? So this is a very interesting question because we are both you know, English majors and we come out of a tradition where you do study one author. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is much of what um, was going on when we were in, in graduate school and undergraduate school. If you were going to be an English major, I remember being, and I went to an HBC, I went to Payne College, and I remember the teacher, the English teacher, looking at us and saying, pick a writer. Mm -hmm. And you must do that person. And I would, I, I loved the people I was reading, and I wanted everybody, but you could only pick one. But that was the tradition. But by the time I got to grad school, and, and there were some other moments I'll talk about, um, I didn't see a one writer I wanted to do. I didn't see one writer. I mean, I ended up having to do a thesis on a woman writer in the 19th century, and because it, it was a recovery era, I did Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, who was a poet, 19th century poet. 
So I, I and it was a master's thesis, so that was fairly fairly easy. When it came to a dissertation, um, that was a bigger bigger project, and I really didn't know who I could do. And you couldn't do living writers. That was the other thing in, in with my era. You couldn't do living writers. I know you had a similar experience. Uh, which is another thing that ties us together. That. You won your battle. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I get all male professors, and I like to tell people that even though I went to an HBCU and didn't graduate from uh, from Barnum, an HBCU professor followed me to graduate school. So I had Saunders Redding, who had been at Hampton for thirty years before he went to Cornell. So he he saw me as one of his regular students at Hampton, and therefore I had that tradition, that HBCU training and mentorship, which I relish. Nothing like it. Um, for, for my entire career, for the most part, you know, the two years at Chapel Hill, notwithstanding. But um, I wanted to, to do something that I felt was just really exciting to me. I had had wonderful experiences in undergrad school. I, I did all kinds of things that people encouraged me to do, including go to Chapel Hill because I wanted to be a journalist. And my English teacher said, you can't get that here. But there's a summer program at Chapel Hill. Why don't you do that? And I did it and ended up transferring there for my, you know, where I graduated from. So I ended up doing the 1930s because it was struck me as a really interesting and radical moment in, in African American culture. And it was as close as I could come to a writer that that I knew, Langston Hughes, and oh, well, the other thing, doing women was also unpopular. So Langston Hughes and Richard Wright and the 1930s, and I decided to do their short fiction. But I was trying to look at the politics and the impact of the politics on their ideas. So I was getting close to Margaret Walker, but I didn't know it. But I couldn't do it in she was living. She was a living writer at the time I was in grad school, so I forget that. Um, so when I did that, and I never published my dissertation. I mean, I did it. It was kind of obligatory. I enjoyed the work. Uh, I was, interestingly enough, I was sent to archives that people had, Clarence Holt, the Schomburg, the new Schomburg Center had not been built. Ernest Kaiser was still living. I could be an assistant to him processing. So I was really in the library all the time. And that was the joy of my dissertation. I was looking at materials that had not been processed, familiar story to a lot of us, <laughs> and, and trying to gather from the correspondence, what was happening during this period? Why were people writing with these new ideas and what was the impact. And so I had some strange, clunky title for my dissertation, Politics and Art or something like that. As I said, I never published it. But it was a decent piece of work. Uh, I wrote about, and I guess that's what happened in this book, about three times as many pages as my thesis advisor accepted. Mm -hmm. So I show this to students today. I'd say, here is my dissertation. When I tell you those three chapters don't make sense, Shell them, and this is what happened to me. <laughs> because I still have those three chapters that never made it into the dissertation that I could not part with. Right. <laughs> because the professor said, that, you don't need that. That's good clarification for you, but it doesn't do anything for the reader. And of course, I was crushed because I wrote that. It's my writing. But somehow, now they ended up in this chapter. This book didn't get that kind of treatment, I guess. I guess it was all important. So, 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 so the idea of doing Walker would have come earlier. Had I been able to do it, because I knew her work. Uh, Carolyn talks about our experience being similar growing up. Poetry <laughs> reading contests when I grew up, Augusta, Georgia is my hometown. Um, and I, my girlfriend and I competed, and I never, I was lost. I had a really wonderful girlfriend, still a best friend of mine, but she was an actress, and we knew that from the very beginning. So she performed for my people that I could never compare with. But we would, I did like some Hughes. Maybe that was for my style. But she would just do James Walter Johnson and Walker and just walk across the stage, and I was none of that. So, uh, but so I knew Walker's work. Uh, but when I did an exchange program at um, Northwestern University, where I ultimately got my master's, Walker was teaching there for the semester. And my wonderful story is that I was bold enough to find out where she was living, and I went to the apartment. <laughs> I think about that day when I tell this to people, like, what? You, you didn't call first? So I went to her and I knocked at the door, and I was fearful. I remember that. I tell some of this in the introduction. But she, was, she had a young daughter with her. Margaret came to the door, and I said, I'm looking for Dr. Alexander. 
and um, and she was, you know, Dr. Alexander, Margaret Walker slash Dr. Alexander. Uh, and she said, well, she's here, but I can smell food coming from the inside. <laughs> One of the skills I did not learn um, that Carolyn excels at, uh, at growing up in the South. And she said, come on in, we're having dinner. <laughs> and that was the beginning. I went to visit her many times during that semester at dinner time. <laughs> and she asked me all the many questions. Who are your people? What church do you go to? She's United Methodist. I was CME. Um, you know, what are you, what are you reading? Um, I had read, you know, I knew Jubilee. I knew For My People, those two books. Uh, and so we, we, we became acquainted. We became acquainted. But then I went to graduate school and wasn't sure of what I wanted to do. And I want to recognize, I hope I can keep saying on this, Betty Parker Smith, who is in the audience, because Betty was at Cornell. And I was at, at she, was, she was in Ithaca. Uh, I was at Cornell, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just loved reading. I was in grad school. I'd gone there, and I hadn't discovered Saunders Redding quite yet. Betty said, come with me to Mississippi in 1973. You need to go to this conference. My mother says nobody goes to Mississippi. What are you doing? I said, well, Betty says I can stay with her godmother. I will be safe. So I came to the Phyllis Wheatley Festival, and I did it. I saw something I had never seen before. It was women. I saw Walker in her heyday. She was, and I tried to replicate what I saw in the pictures in the book. One of the reasons I had a big argument with publishers that I wanted 80, book, 80 pictures, and they usually give you 30. And I said, what do I have to do? Well, you're going to lose your marketing budget. I said, OK, I know how to market. <laughs> I want any pictures because I wanted to show some of that here one from the Phillips Philip Wheatley Festival. And Roy Lewis was co operative. I've got the images from here. And I wanted to show the power of that moment and what it felt like when I entered in as a really young woman, mm -hmm. seeing women talk to each other, argue with each other. Uh, it was intensely political. But Marnie was in charge of it all. Mm -hmm. And this notion of what we call today interdisciplinarity and public engagement. Mm -hmm. All these terms that are popular right now, Walker was doing it all. Mm -hmm. And so having those experiences and then coming to Mississippi to teach, to teach start my career in, in the 80s, there was nothing else I could do but hightail it up to Jackson and you know figure out how I could be of service to Margaret Walker, and that's why those books emerged because she said, "Yeah, I need some help. I want to get these books published." Part of her, you know, choices she had made was not to be able to have that kind of support for a good bit of her life. So I became that sort of support person who could help her publish some of her essays, which I still think need to do more, which I think need to be done, as I say this right now. So that was the journey. Well, that that is an amazing story. And then just it 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 was a it was a sign at certain mm -hmm. point. Like mm -hmm. Nothing else yeah. matters. And I saw someone who was so different from what I knew and what I had been exposed to, what I had seen, what I was told was the right thing to do. And she did all of those things that weren't necessarily the right things to do. And I thought, yeah, mm -hmm. you can do that. Mm -hmm. Who gives a <laughs> if this is what you think is the right thing to do, the right path to follow, what makes a difference in the lives of your people, then you do it. Well, so just, just I wanted to model. She had that model because I thought it got lost. But mm -hmm. As the 20 years rolled by, less and less we heard of Margaret Walker. She became very under that heap of some of the negative stuff that happened in her life. People remember the bad things, they don't remember the good things. Right. And I felt like, nah, that's not going to be. I need to tell this story on the inside out. Well, that, that is a wonderful testament. And uh, I was here for the Phyllis Wheatley yes, right. Phyllis Wheatley Conference as a student, and it indelibly uh, marked how I saw Jackson State. Yeah. It was just a powerhouse of literature and an attractive space for women writers to come it was just marvelous and of course i was an english major and walk, watching margaret walker you know whole court in the halls in the offices i never had a class with her but her presence was was well felt 
I was an Ivy and she was an AKA that mm -hmm. I had to <laughs> go find out about. So, <laughs> and do uh, what she said. So I uh, I have a special attraction to her. So that's, that's another pl uh, place we have in common. One of the things you talked about, and I think these, you know, the, the, uh, the dinner and who's your people and and um, taking you under her wings and says, yes, I need this help. Some of those are kinds of things that are that we are accustomed to about growing up in the South. And one of the interesting things that um, Miriam talks about in this book is sort of two points of, of the South in Margaret Walker's life. One was when Langston Hughes told her mother, if she's going to get the attention, if she's going to grow, then you need to get her out of the South. And then there is this wonderful moment where she comes back. In fact, when she um, decides to stay and come to Jackson State and accept the job offer at Jackson State, she calls the South her harbor, her state harbor. And so I, I wanted you to share with us um, in your writing and your researching and your knowledge of Walker, what was that um, contested relationship with the South and is it, how did she get beyond this moment of you need to get out of the South to coming back and staying here and making the South her place? So Walker would have been content to just leave New Orleans. She was, um, I want to choose my words carefully here. Um, <laughs> and I did have conversations with her siblings before they passed. And it was generally agreed that she was the, the child in the family who talked back <laughs> to the parents. She gave a model not to be emulated to the rest of her siblings. <laughs> they all said, we saw what happened when you did this, and we knew to keep quiet. Her mm -hmm. brother, who was called her brother, who never let his family know he was a jazz musician. Because if you if your parents didn't like it, you just don't talk about it. Right. But Walker said what she thought, and she did that from day one, the day she could talk. So mm -hmm. she was, you know, a, a difficult child in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've had difficult children, so I know what that. Is. <laughs> I'm sure, I was one of those too. But but that tension between what she got from living in the South. She lived around the corner from uh, the, 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 the colored branch of the library in, Jack, in, in North New Orleans. So she spent a lot of time in the library. She's well, she's well educated. Um, uh, in the PowerPoint that I have, um, the steward sent me the picture of Gilbert Academy. I used that to point out that early education, black education, was, 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 a, was foundational mm -hmm. uh, in our communities, in our segregated communities. And Walker had the benefit of, of, of those, that early education. Um, and so, what she knew and what she learned in the life with her grandmother and the stories that she was told that led to Jubilee, all of that was rooted in the South for her. The, the best of her life as she remembered it, the stories that she knew she would write. Um, the education, when Langston says, get her out of the South, it's really to get exposure, to advance her education, to learn about the rest of the world, but it never meant to her that you would live out your life there. Mm -hmm. There are two kind of groups of communities that we think about when we think about the South. Those who migrated, and as Alfred Dean Harrison used to say, those who stayed. Right. Mm -hmm. And for many who migrated, the coming back mm -hmm. was just as important as the story. Right. And so there was no real tension there. It was like, when I come back, it is the South that I know, the South that I love, the South that I will uh, live out my life, my children, I'll raise my children. And she was close to her parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was as close as she could get and have a job. Mm -hmm. right. And she was back and forth to New Orleans all the time. Mm -hmm. When she first came, she had a, a, a young child her parents kept the children because she was living in, in housing, campus housing. Her husband did not join her. There was a potential divorce um, 
in, in the midst there because he swore he was not going to go any deeper south in North Carolina. <laughs> so that was another issue. It's like, I mean, I mean North Carolina is my home. This is where I brought you as my marriage, my wife. This is, you need to stay where I want you to stay. No. We need to have two incomes. This job has been offered to me, and I'm going to take it. And she knew immediately that she would never leave when she came to Jackson State. Not easy to stay, staying at Jackson State, but she knew that. But the tension, yes, there was tension. People were jealous of her. She was a very uh, ambitious woman. We, we could say that about her. It didn't mean that going to Jackson State would diminish what she had hoped to do and accomplish. It might be a little bit harder, but she was going to do it. And whatever she set out to do, she would do. And that often got her in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because she would be determined to do it. It didn't matter who told her what, just as going back to school, when she is a mature woman with teenage children, four kids, she's going to go back to get a PhD, live away from home. Right. Who does that? Right. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. no. laughs> but we know people, a lot of people did do that. And she was one of those women who did that, who left home, but her husband was fully invested in supporting her. And that was an interesting <coughs> complexity in her life as well, because they grew into that relationship right. over time. I think it's an important point you make that yes. you know, she understood and what Lake Hughes was saying, you know, and she was able to make those connections at Northwestern, Cornell, yes. New York. Yes. And so yes. she was able to do that and promote her career, but stayed central to exactly. the place that really fed her created creatively. And it was I the think, offer. Yeah, yeah. It absolutely. was the offer, absolutely. as she was saying. And she did not take for granted the gift in a sense that she'd been given. I have been brought back to the place that I can call home. Jackson will be my home. My children will have a place. My family is nearby. And it, these are the roots. Mm -hmm. And so no, nothing else mattered. I mean, when she made her choice, mm -hmm. and she had her career early, and perhaps that's a very distinguishing feature for her that was different from other people. Her first, first book was published before she got married. And it was an award-winning book. Right. It won the first major award mm -hmm. by any black writer in this country. Mm -hmm. The first major, the Yale series of the younger former poets, mm -hmm. For My People as a Book. Mm -hmm. So she had a career and, and reputation before mm -hmm. the rest of her life got underway. So Walker's Mind, I've accomplished a whole lot, and she had. Mm -hmm. So had she been struggling to make that career come about some years later, it may have been different. But she had that early career, and she could have be somewhat confident mm -hmm. that she could continue to do that. Now, she might have been overly confident that she could do it all. <laughs> Many of us have that problem, apparently not. <laughs> but she knew that she felt comfortable. I've got the book, you know, and I'm going to do something. I'm yeah. going to keep doing she the work. That's true. And, uh, That's true. and the drivenness that she had did get her through that process. Mm -hmm. It took longer. You know, it took 30 or 40 years to do what you believe, but it was a story our grandmother told, right. as you know. Right. But uh, all that was centered in the South. That mm -hmm. story had come from her grandmother. That's mm -hmm. what it reached her. So I just don't think she would have been comfortable. And she wasn't. She also talked about the up South, down South. Mm -hmm. She always talked about, hmm, people tell me that North is all of this, but it seems like it's just up South. <laughs> it's the same situation down. It's just different. People try to do it slightly differently. I mean, she was at Northwestern, and she could live on campus. She had to live in, you know, family housing. Parents and set her into a place that her father had lived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they had to find her a place off campus to stay, but she couldn't live on campus. They couldn't use a swimming pool. All kinds of student activism at that time that we think about now. Mm -hmm. She was engaged in that at Northwestern. She was helping to write letters to the president, mm -hmm. and he's saying. You all are guests here. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing asking for these privileges? Well, this is a private school. But Northwestern didn't have to admit those students. So he was right in that sense. So she didn't see any great value other than the education because she had 
caring teachers, dedicated teachers, and she did have that, mm -hmm. almost exclusively male, but she did think that she was getting a really first-rate education, just as Langston had said. Mm -hmm. Get her out of the South. She got what she needed from, 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 the, from the Northern schools, and she came right back here. So. Now, the place certainly that was central in her life in the South and where she was actually able to transform uh, women's literature, where she was able to do some educational reform and really make a difference was at Jackson State. Um, she was uh, she was here when Reddix, she came in 1949 when Reddix was the president. She helped to organize the 75th anniversary uh, uh, anniversary of the institution. Did that she, picture? Yes, oh, and yeah. she wrote uh, the inauguration poem for John Peoples' inauguration ode to the sixth president of Jackson State University. Um, she had a really great relationship with John Peoples, and I just want to read just one paragraph that she says about Jackson State, and it was also, what, I guess in the 70s, then uh, as, as uh, Redding went to North Carolina, at, was it North Carolina or Cornell? They yeah. took him away from Hampton. That's right. And so in the 70s, when they were trying to integrate the faculties on these campus, often they would go to uh, historically black colleges and get seasoned professors. It's interesting, they didn't want the young professors because they didn't, they didn't want the activism, but they wanted the, the experience. And so she was wooed by schools to go away, but she decided to stay at Jackson State. And she said, um, and Miriam writes, in reaching the decision not to accept any of the offers, offers promising to do short-term residencies instead, she went through the routine process, taking stock of her general situation, parsing ethical and personal factors. Uprooting and having to build a new life in late middle age was not appealing. She surmised that since she was finally feeling productive and necessary at Jackson State, respected and working under a supportive president, there was really no need to move. <laughs> Reimagining a way to translate her creative and intellectual interests with the least amount of personal disruption, which any move would require, gave her enormous comfort. And so this is what Jackson State meant to her. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you go into in the book about the relationship that she had with peoples um, what's, <laughs> but, you, but what with those presidents? That's fine. I think us, we who are Jacksonians certainly want to know that. And I think um, the point that, that resonated with me so much is Margaret Walker was not just um, an ornament at Jackson State. Margaret Walker was central to educational reform, to the curriculum, to uh, who was taught, to the programming, to the uh, writing poems for the inauguration and planning uh, programs for the campus, and speaking out, which I will talk about in a little bit, her own activism, and uh, doing that interview right before the 1970 um, riots, the massacre at Jackson State. So she was central in that, and I just think that it would be important for um, us to hear your thoughts about that and what you came to know about the uh, administrative and integral relationship that uh, Margaret Walker had with this school. So by the time that I had finished the drafts of the book, and of course, you know, rewriting is writing is rewriting. <laughs> so, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of drafts and versions, but by the time I had gotten through so much of her life, that I realized that Walker was so determined. When she wanted to do something, it's like submitting to the For My People three times. Mm -hmm. So you didn't win for the first time. You just keep doing it until mm -hmm. you win. Mm -hmm. um, there was never this idea that it can't be done. The persistence um, and the pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, if I didn't get it, quite right, let me figure out how to do it. So she was she was known for pushing buttons. She had an agenda. She wanted to accomplish it. And she could find a way to do it. And even though she and Jacob Reddix did not get along very well, 
And again, it was a three timer. She kept applying for the leave to go back to grad school. He'd say no. She kept applying, applying. Mm -hmm. and she would do all the things that she thought, like the 75th anniversary. She did all of that to try to appeal to this man that she was going to have permission, have to get permission from to go away to get her PhD. But she had a reason. She wanted to secure a job. She wanted to stay at Jackson State. She didn't have a PhD. She felt as if she didn't have that. If she had that, that would keep her grounded. And she was correct. I mean, you know, other people come along, she might not be selected to stay. But with John Peoples, he immediately understood that he had had one person that Jackson stayed on his side. Right. <laughs> and so he hightailed it to her. <laughs> and they became really good friends. And it was one of those closed door conversations. And he was good enough to give me an interview. And so we closed the door, you know, first day on campus. This is what I want. And this is what I'll do for you. It was one of those kinds of things. You give me X, Y, Z, I want this center, this institute as you called it, and you got me for the rest of, the, of my life. Right? <laughs> I will not leave. So all of those things were part of it. And, and one question she wanted, or one promise from him, I don't want answer to anybody but you. No deans, no provosts. I report directly to the president. Right. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Was he, he advocated for later. the funding for the institute. So he advocated for the funding. Mm -hmm. And he was a very smooth operator. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed that interview with him. And he is one of the few people who's still living that mm -hmm. I had a really, I mean, just clarify so many things. It's like, I knew that I had to make, there were any conflicts that she had had with former presidents, they could not carry over with me. And so at that point, she was not having to teach anymore. She was running the institute, and that was the beginning of the, the mm -hmm. institutes, the Margaret Walker Center today's real flourishing mm -hmm. at that time because she was able to secure funding mm -hmm. more easily. And all she had to report to was the president. Nobody could touch her. And she didn't she didn't 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 mind saying to people, you can't tell me what to do because I talk to the president. <laughs> you can imagine the kind of person that does that. Mm -hmm. You don't make a lot of friends. Right. It was okay. also a testament to John Peoples' <coughs> commitment to the liberal arts. Right. I, I thought that was mm -hmm. quite interesting. Yeah, he says, I've got chops in these other areas, right. but you know, I don't have this. Yeah. And for us to be a first rate university, we need to embellish our work in the liberal arts. And right. he thought Marty Walker was no better person to, to, than to do it because of her own production, yeah. Yeah. but also because of her, her high, high standard of excellence. And he knew that he wasn't going to have to watch over her and micromanage. He knew that if Margaret Walker was gonna do it, it was gonna be done right. And so she fed into his uh, larger vision for Jackson State and the high excellence of that vision and she um, and he he supported her in, in what she was trying to do. So that was really really remarkable for me. And I think you know we're sitting here today in what is you know the jewel at Jackson right. State and is you know has Margaret Walker's hand and dare I say John Peoples' hand <laughs> all over it. Um, I think as an extension of that is what is Margaret Walker's activism. That was also uh, something that I learned about in this book that um, I think in 19, well, you know, it was 69, you think the 60s are over and things are gonna be better, but that entry, um, Margaret Walker did these first of the year entries in her journal and she was saying, this was after the 1969 riot of the Black Panther headquarters in, in Chicago. And then, so she says, oh my goodness, you know, we, we're not, we're not finished with this yet. And she was she was really livid about that. And then, of course, later in 1970, in May of 70, she was doing the hard interviews that people didn't want to do about that activism. And according to your reporting here, and you may be able to tell us more about that, she had done an interview with one of the television stations and was straightforward mm -hmm. and that it was the next day that they came on campus mm -hmm. uh, angry because of what she had said wow. so tell us some more about that so remember walker had become politicized in the 1930s in chicago mm -hmm. it's a very important part of her life 
and one thinks that she was young and foolish and you know you do things when you're young you regret them later on she never regretted that the only part of that period of her life that she regretted was not going to church mm. and she called she did call that period her years of apostasy mm. because she came back to church but she never left it never lost the activism never lost the political analysis that gave her the understanding of the world changes in the world um, she was anti-capitalist to the death. Um, she understood the systems of government and right. systems of control and exploitation. She had been trained in Marxism. Right. There's no question about that. She joined one of the parties at the time. I mean, she was led some part by Richard Wright, but she was young. She was learning. Again, the impetus to get you out of the South so you can learn all there is to learn doesn't mean that you are not the same person that you are. It's that you have expanded your knowledge and understanding, and you can make better use of it wherever you go, whatever you do. Um, so that activism, that that political mind, and I must, just as an aside, one of the things that I still hope to do and haven't done is that pull those political essays together, the writings, because she has a lot of that. The two volumes we did don't include a lot of that. And so you might not get that impression, but I felt that they weren't a fit for those two books, The Power of Jubilee and On Being Female, Black, and Free. Some of those are there, but there are lots of essays that she wrote that didn't get published. So when she was, at, at various moments during the, the years that she lived, this political understanding was necessary as part of the analysis of what was going on. And it would be, she picked her journal, pages and pages and pages of what was going on. Occasionally, she would publish things like the Clarence Thomas issue. She tore mm -hmm. both Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas apart. Mm -hmm. And that essay did get published. Mm -hmm. But that is not what we know. We don't know her that way. Right. Uh, so her, her ideas and her, her thinking was very advanced in, in, in those ways. Um, so whenever something would happen, she would be, re she would re be reminded that the world has not changed. This analysis that I learned really is playing itself out. Mm -hmm. You know, change, you know, movements come and they go. And we build on what we know. And it takes people to form a movement. In terms of her work, she always, some people are asking her about, you know, what activism. She said, my art is my activism. Right. Right. That's what I do. My art, my work is what I do. That's the contribution I'm making. Mm -hmm. And you read the work for my people. Prophets for a new day. Mm -hmm. You know, October Journey is a lot more personal, perhaps. Mm -hmm. but when you read the, the larger part of her work, you recognize that she is giving her work to people. She is bringing it into her spirit. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, I had that point read at the uh, two museums the other day, and people heard her voice. <clears throat> it's, it's just an incredibly powerful voice. It was from 1975. That's the Folkways album. It's just crystal clear. And you hear the power, the, the strength, and you hear the emergence of the of her, her spirit. So it is the political analysis that she was very much driven to. She could have conversations with the best. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite pictures in the book is her with the, the, the congressman when she's arguing for the money for the center <laughs> at Capitol Hill. And she's got her brocade and she's standing up for, among four white men. All senators and congressmen. Yes, the Nancy Pelosi moment. Give us this money. I mean, literally, and she goes to Capitol Hill. She doesn't care. She's going to speak to those men, and she brought the people here to Jackson State. Yeah. She fed them well, and then preached to them. Well. And they said, they said. Wow, we were, you know, we were weak now, we ate too much. <laughs> so that political side of her, the traditional politics and the left politics, mm -hmm. were were in, in, in concert right. in her. Yeah. And she understood the analysis. And again, the leading, you know, young people were leading. And so whenever young people were stepping out front, she yes. believed that she needed to be in support of that. Yeah. And, and that is um, the great testament of this this bio is that we get to know Margaret Walker in in full. You know that we a part of her life you might not know, and it's all so enriching and so exemplary. And she had struggles too. I mean, we could talk about that. The struggles she had, you know, wanting to get the recognition she deserved, a troubled marriage, 
all of those things, but she was able to prevail in, in the kinds of contributions that she wanted to make. So let me ask you this, um, given her life, given you know, the many facets of her life as poet, as novelist, as, as essayist, uh, as leader, as institution builder, um, in what ways do you think teachers of literature or history or um, cultural studies, um, creative writing, um, in what ways do you think they could use this book or examples of Margaret Walker's life to teach and inspire their own students? What, what is the lesson in Margaret Walker's life? So I don't know if I have come up with a satisfactory answer to that question I've been asked many times. I mean, I, I have answers. Um, and part of it has to do with time, place, and condition. That is, Walker was of a particular time and era. And so when we see her model, and I respected that model, I'm from the South, I was, my father died when I was very young, and so I had three women in my life, and I continue to have women in, in my life who were just enormously supportive. Um, and I would see those people as models. I would take from them what, what I thought I could learn. And I think that sort of generation that she was from, where you, she could become a model for someone, I think that's still possible um, because she pursued her goals. She was creative and inventive. If one way didn't work, she tried another path. She was, she was persistent. She never gave up. And so you want to pass on to people and to young people who are reading and to writers. You want people to see it's doable. It may be hard. If she can do it, you can do it. But that answer doesn't quite work for me, but I think I would say more today are really to, to, to reinsert walk into conversations that we're having that are of literary merit, literary significance, is like, what are the, the, the areas of work, genres that she continued to, that continue to evolve through her work, ways in which she entered into conversations as a public intellectual through the form of the essay. If you talk about a writer, poet, novelist, the essential elements of the Leo Slate narrative, mm -hmm. the Jubilee. Right. 1966, Morrison was 1988, right. 20 years earlier mm -hmm. with Beloved. We have this predecessor that helps to shape That's a right. new genre. That's right. The personal essay. Mm -hmm. Some of those are published, but lots of those remain unpublished. So in terms of our literary contribution, we have severely understated, under access, at access, and under evaluated and understudied fully, and she is seriously understudied. Mm -hmm in terms of that. And so foundational people in key areas, I think that in literary studies, we have to return to when was this first discussed? When did it emerge? I mean, the idea of folk culture. Walker called Jubilee a folk novel. That was the name she used for it because it was 1966. So it wasn't historical fiction. Right. Yeah, was a, and she fought with the professor because she wanted to have different types of poems in for my people. And you know, it's basically in two parts. Right. You know, it's the the folk narratives that become poems, part two, and then it's the lyrical right. poem that in, uses some of the modernist themes mm -hmm. in part one. Right. And she said, I can put those, she's a woman of contradictions, I can put those two things together in one book. Right. You know, the ballads, mm -hmm. you know. And and when she reads those ballads, and I've heard her read, I mean, you you could fall out. Right. Because she, she's really good. She's a real performative person and that, that spirit. So I do want us to know the literary contributions. I yeah. want people to know that. I want people to recognize that Walker took lived experience, historical under knowledge, and turned it into something that was that people could consume, mm -hmm. that people could appreciate. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And she did it through these literary genres. She would change the genres to meet her needs. Right, right. right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or, and fight with the people who say you can't do that. Right. And that's the part I think I like most about yeah. her. It's like when I get ready to go and do a fight, which I often have to do, it's like I could be Michael Walker today. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. I know that. I know that. <laughs> it's like, I don't care. You can find me tomorrow. Blah, 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 blah. But I do want to recognize, I do want, because we have such an emphasis now on excellence, which she had, but people are getting awards today, all kinds of awards, and people are getting Pulitzers and, you know, poets. And Walker got an award. But she doesn't have that sort of public right. recognition, nor did she have a real public platform. Right. And people have that today. Yeah. You get a public platform, which is why the conference in, in November is going to bring some of those people together mm -hmm. who have Nicole Hannah Jones. We're going to bring people with public platforms mm -hmm. to try to talk about. And the extent that I can, I am going to say. When you don't have one, you could be a Margaret Walker, but if you have one, can you imagine what it could have been like had she had that? Right. And having her in those conversations, I think, is absolutely crucial. Yeah. And, and I think probably the closest she had to that public platform was Jackson State. Jackson State. And, 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 the center. and that is something that we can really be proud of and build on. Mm -hmm. um, before I turn it over to the audience with some questions, there, this, there, here comes the question that I know you always get asked, and that's the title, The House Where My Soul Lives. Tell us about I knew you were going to ask that, <laughs> so that's why you saw me scrambling <laughs> up here. Um, so uh, chapter six, The House Where My Soul Lives, that is the, what do you call that, the, uh, the, 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 the title poem or the title chapter. Uh -huh. um, every title of the chapter comes from our walk and it's beautiful i don't know how you did it it's just astounding. um and it's tied to a question that that you haven't asked that everybody else asks is what were the obstacles to this book and i always say it was me and i say what the obstacle is but one of the things that i figured out that really pleased me was that i could get as much of walker's ideas and voice mm -hmm. and words in the book as I could as possible. And one way of doing it was the titles. Mm -hmm. And so this title is in chapter six, and I'm going to read, give you a context. Um, this was a 1934 journal entry where she was starting to become more aware of the world. Uh, her, her parents also had a conflict in relationships. And she wrote about that a lot in the journal, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, one of the reasons why she fought so hard to make her marriage work, because she did not want to have those kind of tensions. And she fully transformed her marriage. I mean, I was not good at that, and I didn't do it. <laughs> um, but I admired the way Walker hung in there and did it. And so it was like I was, what is it? I was living through her experience of being able to turn it around and just, and, and, and so when I, and, and Robbie, Robbie knows this, on when I read at the two museums, I read what I call the end of the love story, because it really was a love story. You know, they were not bitter enemies at the end of their life. He stayed right there with her until she did have the last thing she could do. So this was a dream she had. Because the inner voice that Walker that emerged in Walker came part from her deep spiritual sensibility, obviously part of the political knowledge that she came into later in life. But it was that deep inner self. And so she was a dreamer. She dreamed a lot. And so she dreamed a lot and she wrote a lot. The journaling was connected to the thoughts she had, didn't have any place to Put them so she put them in a the journal mm -hmm. and so this is a journal entry where she was thinking through some of her own ideas and trying to put things down um and it it is an interesting passage and i kept coming back to this passage for some reason because i couldn't figure it out so 
I decided that this is when she was struggling with voice, the inner voice. So I'm quoting Marty Walker right now, saying about one of her dreams and moments of clarity. I do not know how many rooms there are, but I like to think there are many, like a labyrinth. Now, this is not going to make a lot of sense, but it's just the way she often just drops things in to the journal and then they will just stand out for me. I like to think that in the last room of my house, my soul lives. Mm -hmm. The idea of a house, I thought was really interesting here. And Walker was a person who, who felt that one of her main obligations was to keep the house, <laughs> make it a home. Right. And where my soul lives, there is a keeper. One who delights in restoring my soul mm -hmm. with the life-giving bread and water of life. The rooms of my house where my conscious self first dwells with assistance and then where my subconscious mind dwells with all her silent upwards. All these rooms must remain spotless. There must be no filth. This is sort of a religious emphasis here. For the Lord of my soul stands guard over my castle. This still doesn't make sense to me. But, and there were a lot of passages like this. I only selected a few because I thought it would be, you would just get lost like I did, trying to figure out what they meant. But this, this idea that the last room of my house is where my soul lives going deep into the inner consciousness. That is where Walker was often up. <coughs> if she felt it, she could do it. If she thought it, she could do it. But it had to be deeply, deeply ingrained in her thought processes, in how she imagined herself to be, the world that she thought she could help make and create in her work. So that's where the house where my soul lives comes from. So everything you see here is a title, is a walker phrase, generally not refrained, lift, lifted literally from the journals and elsewhere. Um, it also was a pattern she used in Jubilee, where she used titles of spirituals. So I was trying to give walkers structure a place in the book as well. And they just and once I figured it out a couple of times, they just kept popping up. <laughs> and about 20 more I used. And I thought, because she just it was like, this is great. I use this one. So I changed a few sometimes, but usually it was I might have cropped a few off, but usually there were just many more ways in which she could help me frame. And so I thought her hand was kind of guiding me. Mm -hmm. And I felt okay. I needed permission. And she was given permission by giving me a title for that particular chapter. Well, well, it adds such a wonderful personal uh, flavor to the book. It, there's a resonance here between you and Mom, Walker yeah. as a result. Yeah. So I'm going to clip the question that I haven't asked you, <laughs> and this will be the last question. As a project that you've worked on for 20 years, and now seeing it in fruition, and you know, we're still in the early stages. Well, the publication date, April, December, December 22nd. 22nd, so we're December, not even six months in. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're five, but, five, six months out. Yeah. But it's here, and you can put your hand on it, and it has a front and a back. It's right to know it's not important. The front, it's, it has a spine. It has a spine. So what has been the most rewarding part of this publication for you? Hmm. Now, I have not been asked that. Now, see, I want to talk about not the positive here. I don't want to. I don't um, know. <laughs> well, a, pre, a, a preface to that. Yesterday, I met with Furnace, Walker's only living son, child. And there's tension, so I'm not going to deliver that. And he had not seen the book. At least he said he had. And I think I believe him because when he looked at it, he stared. Mm -hmm. And he said, I like it. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then he complained about some other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the complaint is that it doesn't have Alexander. Right. Right. I tried to explain that, but I knew I wouldn't get anywhere, so I didn't even fight. It. Right. So, and I had figured out a way to address that in the future, but he liked it. And I said, this is the Martin Walker that I think most people know. And he said, you're right. Nobody knows her as a young woman. They're not living with anymore. And so, so I was pleased that gave me pleasure that he, you know, saw the book as um, representative. Um, it, he, he thought this picture was the right one to use. And I had had not been having, you know, constructive conversations with him. So that was one of those components for me. So that's my prefatory statement. I think when I go places, something gets affirmed. When people pick out a passage and say, I like the way you did this. And I'm and I know that that's something I really worked on. Mm -hmm. some sections was, this, this book is, my personal view, the book is overwritten. That is, a better, a good editor, which I did not have at Oxford, a, a, a good editor would have trimmed it down a little bit and given you more of a sized biography. <laughs> because there are, it is really pretty big, mm -hmm. um, not just for the pictures. So, but I get affirmed that I spent that much time mm -hmm explaining to you what the analysis is that I've given to something like the Alex Haley controversy. Right. Richard writes, right. you know, right. I, I, I did love it. I said it one time in my life. Um, those controversies that colored her life and ultimately, if you want to use this word, you know, brought her down mm -hmm. a notch that, that she could not reclaim because she didn't have, again, sort of the public platform that she could drop something in mm -hmm. and it would counter right. all of that. Right. People remember the bad, they don't remember the good. Right. And so in a sense, I felt affirmed that all the good I was able to put in this book so that people would know the way Walker's life and work is so foundational to what we are just now discovering right. in a lot of instances. Every time somebody says the public humanity, that's like Mario Walker. Right. Right. Nobody right. does the public humanities like Mario Walker. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I feel good. That's yes. what gives me great satisfaction is that I've been able to tell people what you don't know about a woman who had to create it all, had right. to get the money to do it, the idea, convince people of the idea, um, and was was a, a magnet for people. She was a magnet for me. Mm -hmm. It's like I saw a different person in the flesh. I saw a regular person doing all the things people do, right. and yet an extraordinary person right. that doesn't do what people do, what other people do. And those two things in the same body. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think telling her story so that you get the good, the bad, the ugly, mm -hmm. um, and you come to understand her a little bit better because as the Alex Haley case right. um, demonstrated, all of her friends, like, why would you do that? Nobody sues Alex Haley. What right. people were you <laughs> thinking, woman? Right. Literally, that's what people say to her. Right. Don't do that. You should never have done that. That's going to destroy your career, and it did. Right. You know, in a sense. So I like the idea that I had a chance to give her her say, yeah. like the Delaney sisters, yeah. right. give her her, her her say. And the way I resolved what I said, the conflict or the difficulty with the book, which I said was me, is that I have three voices in the book. Walter's journals, lots of voice. She's there. She's all here. You know, you read her, you can say, "Yep, that sounds like her," and it is because it's right straight out of the books there. Um, and so her voice is here consistently. The timeline is there where you have to keep up with what happened when historical events that are contextualizing it. And then my voice is the talking back to those mm -hmm. instances. It's the talking back. And that's probably where I could have cut some, but I felt like I need to explain to you 
but I understood her to be doing when she did right. this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, all the various examples are there, but I'm talking a lot in the book in response to something that I set up that Walker has already talked about, that she's already inter interjected herself into the chapter. So you see a lot of her, you know, set off in quotes. A few things, of course, are in passages, but mostly she's 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 her voice is just singularly presented. Um, but I I do have a lot of explication, a lot of analysis. Some of that's kind of literary. I was trying to keep it in a voice that anybody would understand. I don't think I'm as successful as I could have been, but I think you get my intent. Yeah. You know why I felt like I had to do that, and you can skip over some of that stuff <laughs> if you want to, because mm -hmm. her voice matters, yes. and she has had something to say all the time, and I didn't want to neglect any opportunity mm -hmm. to give you know, Walker the chance to speak. So I feel okay about the length of the book. But you can put it down and come back to it. Well, I will say this. And there's a sheet in between the content. Yes. Yeah. I will say this. And I will say this to you who are picking it up and reading it. Do not be daunted by the 600 pages. It is beautifully written. Um, I don't think I've read, maybe because I know her and I know you, but the entry for the reader is so, is effortless. It's, and that's a testament to how well you write. I know you as a as a captain, as an efficiency expert. <laughs> and I'm so happy that you Slave sat master. down and took a long time and yeah. did this yeah. and loved every word and respected her. And it's a great tribute to Margaret Walker. It's um, by extension a great tribute to the Margaret Walker Center and to Jackson State University. So thank you very much. Time for some questions. See, Lee. Can you talk a little bit when you talk about Dr. Alexander not being as noted as she should be? Could you talk a little bit about that's also because she was too human? And when I say that, I mean she was a forerunner to the Black Arts Movement, yet she never gave up Christianity. She was a forerunner to the feminist movement. Yes, she she, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I've always argued that the reason that she's also not as noted, because she wasn't as flat and one dimensional as a lot of writers who came after her mm -hmm. who were easily boxed and pitched in, which means that they weren't as well crafted as her. Mm -hmm. And could you speak to some of that in the So way? so I think I think that is definitely something to the fact that she did not she she questioned every trend that that was out that was out there. She always questioned. She came, as I say here, slowly to understanding why the feminist movement took such a strong hold of the country. She came to understand it, and she even inserted some of the understanding into what had happened and what her experiences were. But it came very late, and she didn't, didn't come easy. Right. Um, even with Jacob Reddix, she said. He's just a tiny little man that doesn't whatever right. she said. Right. She never considered it could be something systematic, right. you know, right. or that, that that there is a way in which you know women are not. She would never acknowledge that because she was like thought she could do anything and everything, and of course nobody would question her, her abilities. Right. Um, so, but yes, I think there is is something about her being utterly human, um, and. Not necessary, and just being a regular person, a regular everyday person who did a lot of the stuff, most of the things that all of us do. Right. Some of us do better or worse than others, like cooking meals every day, making sure children are off to school, right. caring about other people's children. Um, a teacher, you know, I, right. I, I tell people sometimes, <clears throat> I grew up with a distinction between educator and scholar. Right. 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 Educator right. was a highly, highly valued profession, being an educator. And that term would often be used. She's an educator. He was an educator. Walker was both educator and a brilliant scholar. Right. Exactly. But it was the educator, the mentor, Curtis King, 
all the people that she mentored right. in different ways. Right. All those women in the Phyllis Weekly Festival. Right. All the stuff that came out of the Phyllis Weekly Festival that she liked or didn't like. Right. You know, the feminists would get together, you know, the, right. uh, I mean, all kinds of people were, were forming communities right, right there under her nose. Exactly. And, exactly. and she started talking about, like, what do they think they're doing? I invite <laughs> them here to do this, and they're going off doing that. Right. Well, that's what you do when you convene people. Right. Right. You bring people together of like mind, and they are going to organize right. Right. under your nose. Exactly. And they may organize against you. Right. That happens. Right. <laughs> so, yes, a human, that humanity that was there. I mean, ultimately, as you know, she called herself, I and mean, when she chose uh, Mrs. Stewart says this a lot, but she chose an ideology. Mm -hmm. It was humanism. Right, right. Was, that was what she held on to. Uh, you know, humanities with the black paradigm. Right, exactly. Those kind of ideas that right. she published. She, the, all of humanity mattered to her, and so she talked about that humanism, humanity in ways that we now talk about it, but she was early on making that distinction between all the things that are wrong, but at the end of the day, humanism <coughs> is what we need to all subscribe to. Right. And she led her life along those paths. So being too human, as you said, mm -hmm. very much gets you in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. It costs you. <laughs> to what extent do you think Margaret Walker's voice or platform will be impactful today mm -hmm. as opposed to years ago, her being that outspoken woman, black woman, uh, who spoke out against not only other ethnicity, uh, uh, well, ethnic, ethnic backgrounds, but also she spoke out against her very own. To what extent do you believe her platform will be respected or heard if she were here today? Well, it's not going to happen unless we insert her into those conversations. I know that for sure. I mean, I have to constantly remind people of the firsts, what she did, what she said, what she created. And some of that, you know, is still buried in the archives. So it doesn't happen unless you put it out. I mean, everything now has to be visible. <clears throat> you have to be able to and you know, uh, secure it, you know, in some kind of digital format, you got to be able to pull it up. It's got to be more accessible. Everything that she did or said, it's got to be accessible. You got to be able to pull quotes from Margaret Walker when you Google. I mean, you really, you just have to do that. And so we have more work to do. We have more work to do. I know Mrs. Stu is sitting there looking back. One of the questions that I was going to ask was about uh, what would she say to us today? Right? Mm -hmm. and what would yeah. she say? Now, clearly, in her biography, she aligns herself with students. It's yeah. just a caution for her not to be aligned. With, if, if, if I'm not aligning myself with the younger generation, then I might be missing something that I need to hear. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that she. Do you think she would have been a champion of the Black Absolutely. Lives Matter? She, she would have been a champion of that. I mean, she would have really, she, she loved it out. Out. She loved Kofi Carmichael when he came to Mississippi, right. Mississippi and said, right. like, how the first time, like, oh my God, the heaven opens up. Uh -huh. right. You know, she, she embraced those ideas. She recognized that, that, you know, that there was a danger mm -hmm. in those kind of things. Uh, on the other hand, she would say to uh, Mira Baraka, you better bring yourself out. Right. Right. And he did. She said, you know, she, so she was cautious on the one yeah. hand, but she embraced all of those ideas. Mm -hmm. But she's not, you know, without a national platform, without inserting her voice into all these conversations. And there's so, it'd be different if you didn't have her voice to insert. Right. But we got a lot of her voice. A lot of her work. Still is what you're saying. Even yeah. with her not being here. Even yeah. with her not, we have it. Right. She left it. And the reason she put it at this place, because she wanted it, it to be here. Right. And sometimes, sometimes I think that the voice, and I'm going to use this term in some ways the way Morrison used it, you know, the voice of the ancestor. I mean, she would have been yeah, an older woman all, with all the traditional trappings standing up right. for student protests. Yeah. I mean, it would yeah. have, 
it could, it has the potential, it seems to me, to change the dynamic that people would listen that would not ordinarily listen, mm -hmm. who are ready to dismiss the youth. Mm -hmm. And then when you get someone like that, you know, it's a Miss Jane Pittman kind of yes. story, yeah. you know, yeah. of yeah. here's someone who is, is, is a, who fills the role of an elder in the community. And she would be speaking out about that. And, and, the, and the difference is, I got this question, I get this question a lot. Um, and sometimes I get upset and I have to calm myself down when I'm answering it because someone will ask, where does she get all of this from? And I have to remind people <laughs> that's why, you know, the Gilbert Academy, New Orleans, that the institutions where people were educated under segregation right. were very, very powerful. Exactly. Um, and one of our arguments with Jacob Reddix was that he held on to too much of that other mentality. Mm -hmm. He did some good things too, no right. question about that, some amazing right. things. But he also told the mind on certain stuff so he would calm student protests right. as opposed to John people who would embrace it right. in a very sophisticated way. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that scene in there where he, he won't let the governor, whoever the mayor, come in. And tell me. He was explaining, I'm trying I to save them to the boo you. I don't right. you come over to the side. Don't march in the, don't in march the procession. Right. 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 You don't march, but he didn't want to do it. was just for you. He knew it. He knew the students would see him in there. <laughs> so you just come to the side here, right. to the back door, like we used to do. Right. <laughs> he wasn't. He didn't know that was what we were saying. Right. So I do think that 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 notion of where this strength and capacity and ability comes in an inner community that is segregated mm -hmm. is misunderstood, woefully misunderstood, mm -hmm. and underestimated. Yeah. Submission. And submission. so submission. I was saying I had to. I got a little bit you know, feisty with one of the questioners, and I'm saying, yeah. Margaret Walker brought that stuff with her. Right. Mm -hmm. She didn't have right. to develop it when she went to New York or right. Chicago. She right. brought that stuff with her. Exactly. She had, even though parents were trying to calm her down and, you know, mind your tongue and that kind of stuff, and write in this journal because you talk too much, right. even right. though they were trying to get her to do that, right. at the end of the day, she was a woman in training, a child in training all her life, mm -hmm. a father who was a minister, and a, a, a degree from Northwestern in religion mm -hmm. and philosophy, a mother who's an extraordinary music educator mm -hmm. teacher, mm -hmm. a music studio in New Orleans, mm -hmm. perhaps the first professional music studio by mm -hmm. a black woman. Wow. And her mother was not a stay-at-home mom, right. just so y'all know. <laughs> right. Grandmama was home, but not a stay-at-home mom for the first time was her. Right. So how are we doing on time? Uh, we're approaching the end. Maybe one more question. Here? Maybe one more question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm sort of as interested as in the story in that too. Uh, I was um, I wanted to pose this question um, uh, to Dr. Graham. Uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, various writers came to Tulu um, to speak um, at the chapel, Woodward Chapel. People like Langston Hughes, Thornton Hurston. County Cullen, Gwendolyn uh, Brooks. And I'm wondering, and of course, Dr. Martin Walker Alexander was one of those uh, speakers. I have an autographed book of Jubilee yeah. in, in, the, in the archives there. Did you come across any of her writings where she explored or maybe had opinions about sister HBCUs, sister institutions within the state of Mississippi? Ah. She had very strong feelings mm -hmm. about HBCUs. She was again critical that they were, and she I say this in the book where she they were being students were being treated, they were not being encouraged to develop their best selves mm -hmm. to get the skills that everybody else was being given. They were being held back. I mean, part of it was her father's resistance to the Booker T form of education mm -hmm. because he went there to school and he left because he didn't like the vocational education model. He wanted the Du Boisian model, mm -hmm. you know, we got that mm -hmm. contradiction. Mm -hmm. So she was a firm believer in HBCUs, but she wanted them to, 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 to give the quality education, the best education, and John Peoples followed that philosophy as well. 
bringing money in to, to build new libraries, to have science programs. And, and so she really did believe that HBCUs had a role to play. She stayed at one all her life. She attended them as part of her own training. And she thought that their role was significant, but they needed to step it up a bit. So she was pretty critical, as I said, of the presidents, but she did like the one who brought Jackson State, she believed, out of sort of the dark days uh, of a type of education. Uh, and she, she has, uh, we talked about that the other day when we were in a bookstore. Some people who were in those humanities programs that she developed at Jackson State, right. when she was revising curriculum mm -hmm. that was going to give people a broader based education. This is what she thought that the role of our institutions were. And so she was going to do as much of that as she could. And you know, bringing people to this campus, having students leave, and I, I was struck by that, having students come to the programs for her events, students were chairing sessions at conferences that she would have. That's where, you get that. That's where I get it from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where we rehearse it so we can do it. But it was like amazing giving people that opportunity to, 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 to develop the fullness of their potential. Never saying I can't do that, but this is where you get to do it. Practice makes perfect. Oh, in fact, we have plenty of us. <laughs> but yes, there is a lot of that kind. Of, and you know, she is a again an oddity in that regard because she comes out of that tradition, and most people in her generation left in their fifties and sixties and ended their career elsewhere. Talking to African American students in high schools and schools, and they don't know the Margaret Walker. Either. Yes, and I can attest. I didn't read the book until I was an adult, and I was wondering why wasn't that on the reading list? Even when I was, was a teacher, then this was before the critical race theory, so I imagine it would yeah. not be considered right now. Right, right. But 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 I, you I mean Jubilee? Yes, oh, Jubilee. I'm um, Jubilee, and in for my people as well. Mm -hmm. The um, in, in the poetry. So, so I'm often offended, and I'm wondering. I was sitting here thinking, as you all were were discussing or uh, lecturing, I, I I I wonder what can we do to get that voice heard? Because you just brought. We have to insert, and we're going to have to be the ones to do it, especially in the era that we are in now with this with the controversy. Uh, the critical race, yeah. race theory. Sounds like a job. I think he's been standing here. Yeah. So we will turn it over to. Did you want to say something? No. Else no. Let's thank Dr. Jamal. Thank you. thank you both so much, and Dr. Graham for this gift. Um, in my mind, I, I, I feel there's no doubt that. Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander was the single greatest intellectual, creative mind, teacher, mentor, who ever set foot on this campus. And it's our great pleasure to get to lift her up every day. And this book is such a treasure for all of us. I want to also thank the staff of the Margaret Walker Center for doing this work every day. Um, our archivist, Ms. Angela Stewart, we have our education and PR manager, Aramie Harris, Dr. Christina Thomas, our visiting scholar through the Mellon Foundation, and our Mellon Oral Historian, Elisa Ray Funderburg. Others are running around here. Mr. Garrett Lee, our Digital Humanities Program Manager. Thanks to the Smithsonian, we are digitizing over the next five years large swaths of our historic collections here at the center. We already have incredible digital collections, including the journals online uh, for you to see now. Uh, Ms. Patrice Jones, who's back here behind the scenes. Our students, Chioma, who's our Digital Humanities um, graduate fellow, who's doing incredible work leading our team. And Caroline is back here, is going to be at the bar serving you wine and beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make sure you put some cash in her tip jar. She has a poor working graduate student. <laughs> um, and, and others. Uh, we have an incredible team that we get to do really remarkable work. And we have exciting things happening this year, y'all really exciting things. The Case Festival, of course, the reception here following it immediately. Tomorrow, please come and support our student, the presentations that are gonna have. 
you can actually get a, a sneak peek of some of the art, the student artwork that's over across the way and installed in our gallery right now. Um, we'll also have a keynote uh, a luncheon address by Dr. E. Howard Ashford of Jackson State Law, whose book, Mississippi Zion, about Itala County, is winning all kinds of awards. He'll be with us. Uh, and then at our final closing keynote address with Dr. Graham uh, and the presentation of the annual Margaret Walker Writing Prize, which is a $1,000 prize to a Jackson State student, and the $500 Doris Derby Visual Arts and Social Justice Award. Last piece um, uh, of housekeeping, I'm going to pass out uh, evaluation. So if you could, please pass these around. We're really grateful for the support of the Mississippi Arts Commission. These evaluations are an important part um, of our reporting. Uh, to the Mississippi Arts Commission, so if you can take the time uh, to fill these out, they'll be helpful. Support the Case Festival, support the Margaret Walker Center, keep an eye out for things the rest of this year, including the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival in November, where we have 15 of the greatest living black women writers in the world who are going to be on this campus in November. I'm not kidding, check it out. An exhibit about Margaret that's going to come with the um, Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival in November that we'll be installing in this space here. We have our core exhibit design team here and friends that are with us today. We're grateful uh, for them as well. And a feasibility study to produce this year. We're, we're working that we'll, we'll finalize in November to produce a new facility for the Margaret Walker Center. There's actually a QR code over here. You could take a, a snapshot with your phone and do a quick online survey for us about what you know about Margaret, what you know about the Margaret Walker Center, what you'd like to see for us in the work we do. There's also a print version of this survey uh, available as well. We hope you'll support and participate in that uh, as well. I think that's it. Am I forgetting anything? At least you like that. You're trying to tell me to uh, remember everything. I, I think that's it. And we do have board members who are present as well, including Dr. Denard, Professor C. Lee McInnes, Dr. Jennifer Young Wallace. I think that's my program before. I think that's the three board members who are here. Thank you guys. The Margaret Walker Center Board is an incredible support for all the work that we do. Enjoy the reception. Thank you all for being here. Let's thank these guys one more time. We do have copies of the book for sale if you'd like to get one. Anybody need a